Hey guys, I apologize for being gone for uh, almost a month, if not more. I've been MIA. I went through a huge life change, and uh, which I self-initiated, by the way. Uh, basically, I did a huge move and downsize and all those good stuff. And now I'm back. I have been told by YouTube marketers that it's good to keep videos consistent and be like a marketer more like a business person but then i gave it a lot of thought and realized that i'm actually no marketer nor am i a business person i'm more of a scientist slash um, self-claim artist and so as a result sometimes my videos are not perfect they are a little bit uh, maybe all over the place and also they are not very consistent so i hope that you guys bear with me i do definitely keep um um, trying to keep the content of high quality and I know that um, some of you at least find these um, content useful especially if you're interested in the and this channel is more specifically geared towards those who are curious or they are already in the field we mainly talk about brain waves um, and also we talk about the future of AI as in AGI and ASI and we explore these ideas um, some of them come from my own research, much of it comes from other scientists' research, and we basically change the, the, um, among different topics, but we keep it within these um, disciplines that I just mentioned. And you don't have to be a student um, in brainwave sciences or cognitive sciences to be part of the channel. They can, you can basically just be curious and maybe just you just want to add um, to your skill set for future. Uh, that would be also a good time to sort of have this food for thought. Today's video is going to be a little bit technical, mainly because um, one of the blog posts that I wrote in 2016, I recently noticed that it had the highest views of all the blog posts that I've written for, for all these years. And that specific blog post was very technical and it included step by step when you use specific type of hardware and software when you're collecting and analyzing EEG data. And so if that is not your cup of tea, maybe this video is this particular view is not for you but in general speaking i try not to keep not to have my videos too technical because i know that a lot of people get bored and it's not very interesting but if you're one of those who um, really need a help like when i did when i was doing my analysis i know that it gets really complicated so to be more specific this video is only when you are using the emotive epoch neuro headset with the eeg lab software which is an open source um, that is freely available to everybody now there are a lot of ways to collect eeg data and analyze them this is only one way and the reason i talk about it is because i use it myself in my dissertation but i also know that a lot of other students want to use these maybe you really want to use emotive but maybe you don't want to use the emotive um, analyze analysis software because it's, it doesn't give you a lot of leeway and then if you want to have more control in that case you could use EEG lab for your purposes so this video would be for you so to be more specific if you're using emotive epoch neuro headset and you want to use EEG lab, which is also combined with MATLAB in, in my case, then this is would be an eagle eye view video for you because there are a lot of details to the analysis of the EEG data, raw EEG data, when it comes to using these hardware and software that I just mentioned. And for that, I am going to write an ebook, and I am actually writing an ebook on that because there's a lot of details that I can't possibly go through in a video. But this video would be like an eagle eye view, um, so that because when I did it, it was very hard. It was extremely, extremely hard, and I got stuck so many times. I wish I had a video like this, and so that's why I decided to. Now, first of all, both. 
EEG lab as well as Emotive Epoch. They have huge tutorials and white papers and all those good stuff that you can freely download from their site. Obviously, it would be a very good idea to read those, but some of them are, it's, it's like pages and pages and pages of reading. And also they have very great forum where everybody's discussing, but of course that also that's age, pages and pages of, of reading these materials. And so when I did my uh, research, when I was doing my dissertation, I read all of those. And so, um, but it was very, um, the volume, the sheer volume was high. And so that's why I'm trying to consolidate everything. But when it comes to installing the hardware and software, I would highly recommend that you read their materials because then if there's anything that you need to know in terms of. One thing I do wanna mention though is that their both hardware and software are much more solid if you use it on Windows machines. I tried them first on Mac machine because I'm a Mac person and it was so, so buggy that I had to midway change it. And so if you want to save time and also save, um, save, um, <laughs> save time basically, then I highly recommend that you go with Windows machine. Um, at the time, I didn't even have a Windows machine, so I went with VMware parallel software and, and so I could switch between Mac and, and Windows on my Mac machine. And that still, that was a little bit buggy. So if you really want to be um, free of all these bugs, then I think Windows, their Windows setting is much more solid than Mac. Another thing you want to prepare for and think about is both the memory as well as the processor of your Windows machine. I highly recommend that you have a computer or use a computer, a Windows machine that is high on RAM, high on memory, and also very fast processor because when you run through, for example, the ICA components of these, um, it, it tends to be extremely slow if you have a slow machine. And so think about it more as, you know, how graphic designers, they always go with the highest RAM and highest uh, processor. That's mainly because it, it eats up a lot of their, uh, their processor power. And so you definitely want to do that because I had to also um, change a lot of my settings midway because my computer at the time was extremely slow. I just didn't have to buy it. I didn't have. Another tip is that when you are installing the EEG lab, they have several different versions. One version, at least when I did it, was that it was EEG lab on top of MATLAB. And if you're familiar with MATLAB, MATLAB is very expensive unless you get the student version, but the, their normal version is very expensive. It's an amazing tool, but in my opinion, it's just too expensive. And so you, if you want to save money, then what you can do is that you can, when once you go to eeglab.com and, and get their software, you can choose the version that it says that it's EEG lab in baked with MATLAB. If you install that version, it's much bigger, but then it'll give you in the future um, more, uh, more um, options to do your graphics and to do your chartings, for example. Okay, so when it comes to data collection, once you collect data from the Emotive Epoch, it saves, you can actually save that data, raw data, raw EEG data on your computer on uh, as a format of EDF, .EDF format. And that EDF format or that EDF file, you can easily import it into onto the EEG lab once you um, save uh, once you install the EEG lab software on your laptop. And those are also the details that I'll talk about more in details when I write about it with, with screenshot and everything. But know that the raw data can be easily imported into the EEG lab and that's what you want. In fact, that is why most of us use software um, because we will have more control over the raw EEG. 
Another um, tip that I wrote here is the channel list. Once you import the ADF file onto from your EEG lab software, um, it'll ask you for the list of channels. And because Emotive Epoch has 14 sensors, it has 14 channels, it's uh, quite logical to think that, okay, if I wanna write which channel I want to, um, which channel of data that I have, um, and I, you wanna give, you wanna indicate that in the EEG lab because EEG lab cannot detect it itself then you would say, okay, it's channel list from one through 14. And however, um, you keep getting error messages if you write channels from one to 14. For some reason, EEG lab software cannot understand it and does not. Um, and so one way around that is to change the channel numbers. And don't ask me why, because I learned it myself from going through tons and tons of, of, of forum discussions, but the numbers that um, worked for me, um, and then I would not get an error message from EEG Lab was to enter channels three, um, and then plus 14, three through 16 or 17 or something like that. Um, and you need to write it so that it's three, and then you have a space in between four space, five space, etc. And so every time you load an EDF file in EEG lab, because you want to analyze that EDF file, you would need to write down the number of channels and you cannot write it one to 14 because then you get error message. So write three space, four space, etc. Now, once you upload the EDF file, as I just mentioned, onto EEG Lab, the EEG Lab needs to locate these channels. And when I say channels, for example, it starts from AF3, which I think is around here, to AF4 and etc. And so EEG Lab would not know where to look for these channels. So you need to um, have a file which is a CED file, by the way, that you refer to uh, or that you have EEG Lab refer to for it to recognize those channels. Otherwise, it doesn't know where to look when you have a raw data because your raw data, the EDF file, is a huge file is ju of just numbers. And so it does need to look at that. And you can actually get that CED file from Emotive and so you can just save it on your computer and just have and just point the the EEG lab software once you get um, prompted by it to that CED file and essentially the CED file the way it looks is that it has different columns and then it starts from column 1 until column 14 and then um, it has um, this this is 1 through 14 and then on top um, it has for example AF3 F4 you know the name of the sensor the name of the channels and then for each cell it has the location or the, um, the yeah the exact location of where EEG should and can find the data corresponding to that specific channel. This is very important because otherwise EEG lab would not be able to read those files. And so when I, when I write about it, I'll also have screenshots for you guys if you want. Now, once you add your, um, your EDF file onto EEG lab, etc., you do need to <coughs> uh, um, run an ICA for that. And you know why ICA is important because you do have, you're gonna probably have a lot of artifacts added to the data already, um, that you, the raw data that you have. And so the ICA can also be run by EEG Lab. And this is the part where it's extremely time consuming if you have a slow computer. Take it from me because it took me forever and I literally had to um, get another laptop because my old laptop just could not um, run through it. It, it uh, takes a lot of memory and also the processor power. 
A quick recap on ICA, if you are not familiar with it, essentially is independent component analysis, and that is what the software does to kind of get away from or get rid of some of these artifacts, or at least analyze them to make sure that um, the data is as, as clean as possible. Um, we can not only rely on ICA, we do need to also delete and clean up some of the data that we have collected, but once you run ICA, it'll actually show you, the EEG lab will show you um, the, the, um, you know, the normal uh, chart that you see from EEG uh, uh, data uh, analysis, and that is when you can go in and you can manually also, if you want, delete some of these artifacts. For example, uh, blinking of eyes, uh, is really an extra noise that you don't want to have it included in your data. And so that and so that is how you can manually get rid of some of those noises, which you should because once you after this, it's the time when you will um, 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 you can use EG lab if you want to make graphs of of the the data that you have collected and that is when you want really want the data to be as clean as possible a lot of people um, obviously uh, criticize eeg uh, signals because for them to be um, for them to be very noisy and while i totally agree with them um, once you get into huge amounts of data, which we've already talked about and we'll talk about more, especially when it comes to ha including AI in it, a lot of this we kind of um, fall away just because a lot of this criticism will fall away because because once you have a lot of data, which is by definition is what AI does, is that you can really compensate for some of the issues that you have, for example, if you have a very small sample size. That does not mean that we should not clean up the data. Obviously, we always have to clean up the data because it's very noisy, but nonetheless, in further future future, those are the things that we'll be able to really accommodate. And so we are in a much better position to have data that we rely on and and um, can feel that it gives us the information that we need so um, that's all i had for today uh, i hope it was helpful i know that a lot of details are needed and hopefully i'll be able to finish my writings and write up and uh, i hope that um, it helps at least some of you out there that probably sometimes get stuck like i was thanks again